Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Regulatory Authority's first online information gathering session on radio frequency and 5G safety. My name is Denton Williams, and I am the Chief Executive of the RA of Bermuda. I will also be the moderator of this event. This is an unprecedented event for us in our public consultation process, and we want to extend our thanks to you for your contribution. Before we begin, I think it's important to restate who we are, what we are doing, and why we are doing it. Who are we? The Regulatory Authority of Bermuda is an independent regulatory body. We promote fair business practices, protect consumers and industry stakeholders, and encourage innovation and integrity in the markets we regulate. In this instance, the electronic communications market. We follow principles such as transparency of information and decision-making and public consultation and participation. What are we doing and why? The RA understands that the topic of 5G technology is of concern to various stakeholders in our community, and we are conducting this public consultation to ensure we hear from you. We have empaneled an independent advisory panel to hear submissions from the public. The panel will then review the feedback and existing information and based on their experience and expertise, offer their advice to the RA's Board of Commissioners before a decision is made on whether 5G technology is suitable for deployment in Bermuda. In alphabetical order, the advisory panel members are Mr. Glenn Blakeney, who was educated in Bermuda and has over 40 years of experience in the communications industry. He is the chairman and CEO of Inter-Island Communications Limited and is responsible for the operation of two FM radio stations in Bermuda. Mr. Blakeney also hosts his own daily radio talk show on local and global current, current events, which is aired in Bermuda and streams live around the world. In 2010, Mr. Blakeney established the Bermuda Soul Record Company Limited, which develops and promotes talented Bermudian artists. Dr. Rodney Croft, is Professor of Health Psychology at the University of Wollongong, Australia. He has been researching non-ionizing radiation since 2000, participates in a variety of national and international scientific and government committees, and has led government-funded centers of research excellence in electromagnetic radiation since 2004. Dr. Croft was appointed to the International Commission on Non-Ionizing non -ionizing Radiation Protection, ICNIRP, Biology Standing Committee in 2008 and May Commission on 2012, and is the current ICNIRP chair. Dr. Jeffrey Hurd is the leader of the RF Technology Group at Lincoln Laboratory at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which develops and demonstrates innovative RF technologies as solutions to emerging national security needs in radar, electronic warfare, and communications. He is the laboratory lead for research on advanced RF technology. MIT is a private research university in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is ranked amongst the top 100 universities in the world. Dr. Rafat Mansour is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Waterloo, and holds Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Micro Nano Integrated RF Systems since 2010. He also held an NSERC Industrial Research Chair for two terms, 2001 to 2005 and 2006 to 2010. Prior to joining the University of Waterloo in January 2000, Dr. Mansour was with ComDev Cambridge, Ontario over the period 1986 to 1999, a major manufacturer of satellite subsystems where he held various technical and management positions in the company corporate R&D department. Professor Mansour holds 39 US and, and Canadian patents and more than 380 refereed publications to his, pub, to his credit. He's a co-author of a 23 chapter chapter book published by Wiley and has contributed six chapters to four other books. And Dr. Karika Weldon, who established and currently leads the Government of Bermuda's on-island COVID-19 testing facilities, 
the Molecular Diagnostic Laboratory. She was born and raised in Bermuda and completed her foundational studies at the Bermuda Institute, Port Royal Primary School and Work Academy. Dr. Weldon achieved her Bachelor's of Science of Honors in Medical Biochemistry and a PhD in Biochemistry from the University of Leicester. And also we have Dr. Kappa, who is a neurologist and clinical neurophysiologist and will act as a consultant to the advisory panel. He's a Bermudian Rhodes Scholar who was educated at Harvard University and Oxford University. Dr. Kappa has 40 years of experience in the human central nervous system as a neurologist with a special interest in neurophysiology. He also has experience in magnetic resonance imaging in humans, both clinical and research applications, and has contributed to and been published in dozens of medical journals and books. Just uh, for the benefit of the public, uh, we'll just do quickly do a recap of the consultation questions and I will read through them uh, right, uh, right now. So the first question in the RA's public consultation is, do you agree that the Federal Communication Commission, which regulates interstate and inter international communications by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable within the United States, it's a ra radio frequency exposure standards are appropriate for Bermuda? If not, what is a suitable alternative and why? Question number two, do you agree that all antennae used by licensed sectoral providers should be registered with the RA? If not, what, if anything, should be registered with the RA for location, example, for location, direction, if applicable, and power level? Question number three, do you agree that the moratorium established by the EGD, that is the emergency general determination which established the moratorium, should be removed? If not, should it be modified and how should it be modified and why? Question number four, do you agree that a real-time publicly accessible radio frequency field intensity monitoring network should be deployed and a dedicated fee be levied on re relevant sectoral providers and end users that use radio frequency spectrum to cover the cost of the deployment and ongoing maintenance? Question number five, should millimeter wave networks and small cell technologies be restricted or prohibited in Bermuda? If so, why and what alternatives should be used? And those are the questions for the consultation. I will quickly go through a reminder of the rules of engagement. So number one, as part of our public consultation, today's event is designed to gather information from the public is not designed as a town hall. Therefore, panel members will not be offering their professional or private perspectives on the topic at this time. All microphones, number two, will be muted unless you are called upon to present. And number three, each participant will have a period of 10 minutes to present their responses to our public consultation questions. Without further ado, our first presenter is Ms. Mac. Mac Ms. Camilla McPherson from Bermuda Advocates for Safe Technology, which is a volunteer group of healthcare and business professionals, teachers and environments, environmentalists whose mission is to educate the community on the dangers of exposure to unsafe levels of wireless radiation. Also speaking on behalf of uh, BAS, which is Bermuda Advocates for Safe Technology, is Dr. Paul Hero, a scientist with experience in physics, engineering, and health sciences. He started his research career at Institut de Recherche de Vaux, Quebec in Varnes, Quebec, an internationally reputed electrotechnical laboratory in Quebec. He was appointed associate professor at McGill University's Faculty of Medicine, where he is the current occupational health program director and also medical scientist in the Department of Surgery at McGill, McGill University Health Center. So uh, Dr. Haro, you can uh, commence your presentation.
uh, the uh, the version of the presentation that you have here is the one that was prepared for two days ago. I have filed a newer one, which is more adapted to this audience, but I can certainly speak to some of these slides. The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the, uh, I would say the innovation of 5G networks is in relation to the uh, bandwidth capacity in the sense that uh, you have more capacity in bits per second, and this depends on the signal to noise ratio. It depends also on the air transparency, and it also depends on the antenna aperture. If you uh, consult the uh, presentation that I just filed, you will see that all of these items mean essentially that uh, the, um, the signal level that is necessary to, uh, to channel more data will ultimately to, do, to the user be, uh, be higher. Furthermore, if the higher frequencies of 5G are used, the penetration depth of the signal will be less. And that means that the higher the frequency, the higher the concentration on the signal on a small fraction of the human body. And the argument that is often presented that 5G has no risk because the penetration depth is very low is very strange because things that don't penetrate the body very much like ultraviolet radiation that penetrates far less than 5G are in fact recognized to be carcinogenic. I also have a slide that speak to the argument that cellular phones are absolutely necessary for economic expansion. And what I want to present is that wireless in times of, of peace is a great liberator. It gives individuals freedom. And for that reason, it is extremely popular. But in terms of productivity, what is observed in the US economy is that the period of introduction of wireless networks actually led to a drop in productivity in industry. So we cannot confuse productivity of industry with personal liberation. So cell phones are a little bit like the personal computer. They gave great autonomy to individuals, but not necessarily did they result in economic uh, advantages. Now, the next slide that I have is in relation to cancer. And this speaks especially to the fact that we now have a very strong basis to demonstrate that the signals of cell phones are not innocuous. We have the US National Toxicology Program result. We have the Italian Ramazzini Institute result. The first one speaks to the use of cell phones near the body. And the second one, the Ramazzini Institute speaks to the use of base stations. Both of these signals apparently are able to increase the rate of cancers in animals. And of course, we have the International Agency for Research on Cancer that has classified both ELF and RF frequencies as potentially carcinogenic. So I believe that it's not a good time right now to increase radiation exposures to the residents of Bermuda because in about two years, there will be a reevaluation of the cancer level that is associated to electromagnetic radiation. And because of this, these new animal studies, it is very likely to be higher. Now, you have to understand that these efforts by the National Toxicology Program and by the Ramazzini Institute are not small scientific efforts. They are major efforts. And in the newer presentation that I sent, you will see illustrations, photographs, of what these efforts were like. And these efforts are considerable. And if I may say so, all the major efforts that were meant to evaluate the, the, the carcinogenicity of these signals essentially have been positive. So it is very, very uh, surprising that we would proceed to enri enrich our environment with this kind of ingredient. And so, why energy intensive wireless? Why not use Spartan and fast optical fiber? And I have a slide that reports that in China, 
the 5G, 5G base station equipment consumes about three times more energy than 4G because of the way the technology works. Uh, the existing 5G technology is very immature. Hundreds of billions of investment have been deployed and the operating cost is extremely high. No application scenarios can be found and it is difficult to digest the costs in the future. This is from the recent Minister of Finance of China, Liu Jiwei. And a last comment, we, what people need now is broadband, more or less optical fiber, and the main content of 5G is not broadband. In fact, human societies do not have an urgent need for 5G. So uh, I also have a slide that shows that there is incredible efficiency from optical networks, less than one picojoule per bit. In other words, wireless system is a big waste of energy, will never be able to support the increasing needs in information that you can forecast in the future. So we also have evidence from the markets that are most mature in China. Few people use the, the 5G network and 73.3% of Chinese consumers believe they don't need a 5G phone. And in this report from the Chinese Academy of Information and Communications Technology, they say it's difficult for ordinary consumers and industry users to see the long-term benefits and rewards of 5G. And so if this expansion in human exposure is not a, uh, accompanied by huge commercial benefits and you don't expect them, why impose this burden on the population? And I also have a slide that you will be able to see. This is a report from the state of New Hampshire. And it's a report that was com completed only 19 days ago. And what this says is that they require that any new wireless antenna located on a state or a municipal right of way or on private property be set back from residences, businesses, and schools. This should be enforceable by the municip municipality during the permitting process unless the owners of residences, businesses, or school districts waive this restriction. So in Appendix K of this report, they say that the setback of, of, uh, of antennas should be 500 meters, which translates 1,640 feet, because closer to this distance, we have documented negative health impacts. And lastly, since the time is very limited, since I am a professor, I want to finish with a multiple choice. Uh, you have probably heard of the 5G appeal to stop deployment on Earth and space. Now, the largest single group to sign this petition were not scientists, they were not physicians, they were not public health officials, they were engineers. And why would engineers sign a petition of that sort? Well, the first choice here is that they believe that the effects seen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer on people, the National Toxicology Program, the Ramadzin Institute by Chu in 1992, by Ripacholi in 1997, and Lurchell in 2015, and those involve 4,288 rats and 2,180 mice. Now, I can receive the criticism that I, as a scientist, may be biased because I'm a specialist in this question. But how can you bias 400, 288 rats and 200 and 180 mice to get more tumors? They can't have bias. And also, these report these health uh, impacts have been reported by the bioinitiative.org report. So that's the first choice. The second choice is that irrespective of the health evidence, maybe engineers do not want to run the risk of being pointed as having spread a carcinogen in their community, particularly if the cancer rating of electromagnetic radiation is raised by IARC in the next two years from 2B to 1, according to Tony Miller of the University of Toronto, or 2A. And because no large underwriter, either Lloyd's or Swiss RE, will cover the risks associated with this radiation. The third reason why they might sign is that they believe that irrespective of health 
or liability issues, engineering can deliver communications using more advanced methods than wireless, and that those methods are more environmentally friendly. And I'm speaking here, of course, to the uh, less than one picojoule per bit uh, that is available from optical fiber. So if uh, Bermuda does not want to take the risks associated with wireless with its population and wants to get the best, I, I, uh, I suggest that a uh, optical fiber to the, wrong, uh, to the home system be deployed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hero. Um, I will just note for the presentation that we had the version that we received 10 minutes ago up, and we just received an uh, updated version that you sent to us. So we will post that to our website so that everyone else can uh, peruse it. So thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Eugene Dean, uh, ch the chairman of Green Rock, a local registered charity which focuses on environmental education and wider sustainability issues. Uh, Mr. Dean, you may commence your presentation. All right. Okay, greetings everyone. Give thanks for the opportunity to present and welcome to all the panelists on the advisory panel. So today, I think we have quite a few people who are gonna speak about the technical ramifications. Um, I spend most of my time in the community. And so I'm gonna give more of a community perspective in the 10 minutes that, that we have been given. So for us, as it relates to Green Rock's position, we are about sustainability and we recognize that in today's world, you know, safe, reliable, fast internet connectivity is now a fundamental human need in our society and required for an environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable Bermuda. Our concern in this instance, which we have shared in, in, in press statements um, recently, is as much to do with the process as the outcome. You know, what we recognize is that people need more time to better understand and feel comfortable with this technology and to have the concerns heard and addressed. There are many people in the community that are concerned about 5G technology. And yes, there are also general concerns about, you know, cell phone or wireless technology, you know, across the board. The thing about that is that, you know, we have the opportunity to choose how much we engage with wireless technology, rather at home, at work, or our children in school. And the understanding is that this option will not be available with the deployment of 5G technology throughout the island. And if it should be the case that there is an option, then we feel that that should be explained. You know, This is a time of extremely heightened health concerns and anxiety for many people in our community as a result of the pandemic. And then this should also be considered and incorporated when addressing this whole initiative. What's happened so far is that people's concerns have been belittled and, and that only increases people's concerns and increases people's resistance. People get more and more radical. And that's a thing that we've been trying to mitigate. You know, We are about the science. You know? So we're suggesting that anybody who has invested interest in seeing 5G technology implemented in Bermuda should be investing the time in making sure that the community is well educated about it and that people's concerns are addressed. You know, As an organization, we're advocates and our goal is to represent people 
and represent the environment. Again, we're looking for sustainability, you know? We're collaborators, so we want to be able to work with organizations, even like the RA and this advisory panel, to be able to assist with making sure that we have a fair and just process. And just a bit about why collaboration is important, you know? Feedback from the community, again, is, is people generally feel like their concerns are just being dismissed, you know, just in general, you know, communities don't tend to have, you know, a very positive relationship with governments as it stands. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's always apprehension when you hear information kind of coming from a top down. The other thing is that in talking with members of the RA, yes, we recognize that efforts have been made, you know, to educate the community. Information is shared on the website, ads have been put in the paper and all sorts of things. But the reality is that people don't really go to the RA website or a lot of other government websites. And unless we're in a position where we're willing to take information to the community, then the community is not gonna really be informed. And in our experience in just being out in the community, people really have had very little knowledge of the fact that this process is going on, you know, and, and even less knowledge about what 5G. Even in interviews recently with our, our, the minister responsible for this area, Minister Raban, when asked, right, from the community about what 5G is on, on radio interviews, has been unable to give a clear and succinct answer. So even that is proof that we need more time to build a general understanding within the community. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to be experts, but people need to know enough to feel comfortable with the technology being implemented and know that it's gonna be, be a benefit to us. I also had a call and I, and I feel I need to share this. You know, I had a call from someone in the community who said that they read one of the ads in the paper about the 5G. And, 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 and their feel for it was that it appears to be an insincere attempt, this is their words, an insincere attempt to say that you've reached out to people. Now, what she said is that I'm not very tax savvy and I see something about I have to go online and make a submission. So I called the RA and I wasn't able to get anyone. So I decided to send a letter in, you know what I mean, to just express my sentiment. So anyway, these are things that are coming from the community. So people are skeptical. The other thing I want to share is like, what is the real business case? We've heard things like 5G is going to help with, you know, virtual reality, online gaming, self-driving cars, faster download speeds. Are these things that we really need? Or are these things that, right, innovators in the industry are looking to push on the community as market employees, you know? And, and the industry can be very good at that, you know? Now, I'm not saying that there's no benefit, but I think more clarity needs to be given on what is the business case. Because from our perspective, being able to download a movie on our phone in six minutes, right? As, as it currently stands, and now then being able to download that same movie in like three seconds, that's, that's not really enough of a business case to justify the deployment of, of such infrastructure all throughout the island. And self-driving cars, again, I'm not sure if that's something that Bermuda necessarily needs, you know, um, and it's gonna really like drive business forward in the country. The other thing I wanna share about is that a lot of concerns have been raised also about our current capacity to manage the wireless infrastructure that we already have on the island. I know one of the questions was about, should we adopt FCC standards in Bermuda? Now, there have been concerns about FCC standards, about them being totally outdated and needed to be revamped and not you know, really protecting, you know, I guess, human and environmental health. So it looks like we don't even have that level of protection in Bermuda. You know? We're still at a place where we need like a public registry of where like all the cell phone towers are. You know, we don't understand that there are any formal setback limits. My understanding, I've seen cell phone towers in people's yards in Bermuda, right in the middle of residential areas. My understanding also is that we have a cell phone tower on top of our hospital, which in a lot of other jurisdictions around the world is just deemed totally unacceptable. 
So also, this is another reason why we feel like we need to take pause with this before bringing in a whole nother level, right, of wireless technology and infrastructure that we get a better handle on managing the infrastructure that we have in place in Bermuda right now. So I'm just going to kind of close off and say that on a, on a personal level, and this is how I'm appealing to everyone, not, not necessarily as professionals, but just as human beings, you know, and I've even heard Denton as the CEO express that, no, we don't want to be in a situation where we're implementing technology that's not going to be safe for our families and our children and things of that nature. So my suggestion would be that we err on the side of caution, that we look at all the data and look at all the science. And if the concerns are valid and there's science that is backing up these concerns, that we err on the side of caution. And we take time with this. It doesn't appear to be anything imminent. And again, if there is something imminent that we need to be mindful of, something that 5G is going to bring to our community that's going to help to transform us and benefit us in a large way, that information needs to be shared, right? Business and technology is designed to benefit people. Technology is meant to make our lives easier, is meant to increase levels of pr productivity. Business is meant to solve problems for people. We keep hearing conversations about the business case and why 5G is important for business and the economy. When business is meant to serve people, likewise technology. So if we are now putting more emphasis on the serving of people, rather than putting the emphasis on people themselves, that's another cause for concern. We have to understand what the purpose of things are and the order of importance of things. And all that we're suggesting is that human health, environmental sustainability is far more important than innovation if that innovation is not in alignment with those principles. So safe technology, we're definitely all for it. And if this 5G technology is going to be safe and bring benefit for our community, then we will help to advocate for that. You know? However, as I stated already, our concerns are more so with the process, and we feel that we should take time to make sure that we're able to get input from the whole community and build consensus that's going to be in the interest of Bermuda and all Bermudians. So give thanks for the opportunity to speak, and, and I wish all you well with what I know must be a challenging process. Give thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, we appreciate your contribution. Uh, next, we have our next presenter is Ms. Uh, Theodora Scarado from the Environmental Health Trust in the United States. EHT is a scientific nonprofit think tank that publishes research and also works directly uh, with communities and health and educational professionals and policymakers to mitigate environmental health hazards. EHT expert scientific team collaborates with experts internationally. EHT will also be represented by Dr. Devra De Davis, president of the EHT, and will also be presenting a short summary of excerpts from the scientific materials submitted to the RA. She was former senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Health in the United States Department of Health and Human Services and served as a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors of the U.S. National Tox Toxicology Program. Uh, Ms. Scarado, you may commence your presentation. Thank you. I, I sent it to you. Are you going to play it or should I play it myself? Yes, we're ready, we're ready to play when, when you wish us to start. Yes, we have submitted extensive documentation and have more that is on the way. So these are some highlights of the research which is included in our written technical submission. And you can ask us any questions, of course. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Let me just make sure my sound's up. 
Good morning. I'm delighted to be with you to talk with you about 5G and what we know at Environmental Health Trust about the problems of estimating exposure, evaluating health and environmental impacts of this new technology. My background is displayed for you here. It may be relevant for you to note that I have experience broadly in the field of public health and the environment, including the member of the team awarded the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore for my work as a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I also have worked as an advisor to the US Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and many others. I'm presenting work that's been developed by my colleague, Paul Benny Shai, who's a physicist now with Ariel University, formerly the director of the Bioelectromagnetics Laboratory at Hebrew University. Dr. Benny Shai did his postdoctoral fellowship at Nagoya University in Japan and has worked at a number of universities in Israel. He's currently uh, was chairman of the Environmental Health Trust Tel Aviv University expert seminar on wireless radiation and health. And we are going to present to you why 5G is highly problematic, especially in an island environment with the dense population that you have. 5G, in fact, can operate at either low, mid, or high band, seen here on this diagram that shows you that for large-scale events in the outdoor environment, you can use uh, low-frequency cells operating at 600 to 900 megahertz, under one gigahertz. Uh, higher frequency cells can operate at one to six gigahertz, and millimeter wave cells are not yet fully operating in most parts of the world today. This is an image that came from an industry workshop on 5G antennas for the next generation. In fact, there are many problems that have been identified with the current generation. I'm going to talk about a few of them now. One of the things we know about radio frequency radiation as seen in this imaging, it was developed by our colleagues in Brazil. Radio frequency radiation, microwave radiation from a cell phone in the pocket does get into the penis and the testes. This is why the Cleveland Clinic has advised men to keep the phone as far from the testes as possible. And it is why our imaging studies have shown the capacity of this radiation to be absorbed into the testis. This next picture shows you work developed by Claudio Fernandez Alvaro de Sales, who direct the Federal University's Laboratory on Bioelectromagnetic Engineering at Porto Alegre, Brazil. And they have produced these stunning images with a so-called laptop showing that the exposure again gets into the top of the thighs and is absorbed heavily into the areas of the reproductive organs. And I should add, into the colorectal area as well, which is an area of interest to us because we are seeing extraordinarily high rates of increase in colorectal cancer in people under the age of 30 in the United States and Iran recently. Finally, you see the image of the developing brain as well as the mature brain. And what you see here is that the radiation is indicated by the yellow spots gets more deeply into the eye of a child and we know that children's brains grow rapidly. They are developing uh, fast. They have not as much myelin to protect them from damage. Their skulls are thinner. They contain more fluid. And for that reason, they get deeper absorption of microwave radiation into the brain. Now, <clears throat> I want to make clear to you, the question you have asked is, are the FCC and ICNRC limits adequate to protect people, the environment, and wildlife? And our answer is no. In our EHT technical submission made with Professor Benny Shai and others, clearly shows that there are adverse effects found at levels far below the FCC and ICNRC limits. And these include, as others will have shown you here today, the capacity to induce cancer in experimental animals when exposed under controlled conditions, the capacity to damage DNA and the brain to cause memory problems in children, and as I mentioned, sperm damage and erectile dysfunction has also been identified in men who are heavy users of cell phone radiation. When it comes to impacts on wildlife, peer-reviewed studies consistently find damage to insects and birds, as well as trees and plants from current permitted levels of radiation from towers that are using 3G and 4G at this time. 
Now, contrary to the FCC and ICNIRP Association, there is no 50 volt safety factor. The assumption is made that at four watts per kilogram, that is the level at which animals will stop trying to seek a food reward when they are deprived of food if they're exposed to microwave radiation. That is the level assumed to cause them to stop trying to seek food. And that level is divided by 50 to give you 0.08 watts per kilogram, which is the current FCC standard. In fact, the actual level at which the animals stopped trying to seek a food reward was one watt per kilogram. That safety factors can be as great as 1,000 to 10,000 or even 100,000, particularly when something is causing cancer, which is the case here. So to use a safety factor of 50, or in fact, even 100, is not adequate for the prevention of the cancer effect that we are all concerned about in this case. You may have heard that because 5G only gets one sixty quarter inch or a few millimeters into the skin, it can have no biological effect. Well, whoever has told you that doesn't understand basic biology. It is now understood by this image taken from a 2019 peer reviewed article in a clinical microbiology review that the skin associated lymphoid tissue is critically important to the immune system, and that things that affect the skin affect the entire body. Think of how well you feel when after the rain you go outside and have a little sunlight on your faces. It affects your whole body. The same thing is true. The skin exposure can affect uh, keratinocytes and the epidermis, which is the so surface of the skin, which then infect the Langerhans cells that can in turn affect major histocytes compatibility complex, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and other things that affect how well your immune system functions. As an example of the ability of the skin to resonate with 5G, this is work done by Dr. Benny Shai in his laboratory at Hebrew University with optical coherence tomography, where you see within from the epidermis, the skin duct, the sweat ducts go down into the skin where they have an effect throughout the body. The sweat ducts resonate like small helical antennas to absorb and reflect that radiation. Thinner skin will absorb more, thicker skin will absorb less, and this work has been published in peer-reviewed journals showing that the skin does have a biological response to millimeter wave technology. Millimeter waves are intensely absorbed into the skin, as you can see from these illustrations from the work of Professor Paul Benny Shai reproduced here. More information can be found on our website about this. Now, I want to turn next to some modeling work that has been done based on open source information that can be accessed around the world of existing networks in Austin, Texas. And what you see on the left in the red circles is the existing coverage of the LTE. And what you see on the right is the proposed deployed 5G network. And the bottom line is to show you that there'll be much more dense exposure to radiation throughout the system. You can turn off your phone, but you can't turn off the network. This is what it looks like in another density map made by these researchers published in the IEEE World Forum on 5G. What they have shown is that 5G infrastructure, when combined with existing infrastructure, will create levels of radiation that cannot yet be classified as safe for the public. And they urge a rethinking of exposure in 5G networks with which we completely and heartily agree. Just to be clear, when 5G is implemented, outdoor exposures will increase exponentially as indicated here in this mapping of the power density that will take place with a fully deployed 5G network for the town of Austin, Texas. This is why once fully employed, there will be no way to escape exposure to the 24 seven operations of the 5G system that will be required. If you'd like more information, please go to our website at ehtrust.org and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have
Okay, Mrs. Uh, Scarado, Ms. Scarado, um, do you have any uh, further comments as uh, this is your speaking slot before we move to the next presenter? Um, I would just like to add that there are many uh, governments that have uh, made the decision to have uh, lower limits and lower thresholds for radio frequency radiation uh, maximum permissible exposure levels. And I think one of the most important issues is that there are no safety limits that have been developed that uh, pertain to trees or insects or birds. And the question to really ask is what is a safe level for uh, insects? What is a safe level for birds which perch on the antennas, which you know, there's gonna be a densification of antennas with uh, 5G deployment, according to what industry uh, is stating in their documentation. So that is a really important gap in accountability that really should be addressed before there is an increase in exposure. And we recommend uh, an educational program for Bermuda so people can learn how to reduce exposure and use safer technology. And then you won't need to uh, increase capacity with, uh, with 5G or with more antennas in neighborhoods if people are using safe wired connections. So there is a solution that is available. And I hope that you will uh, investigate that. And really, you know, until there is safety limits that protect the environment, I think um, no further radio frequency radiation level should be uh, allowed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Corrado. We appreciate your contribution. Thank you very much. I apologize for the technical difficulties earlier on. Okay, thanks. We have our next presenter, uh, Mr. Frank Clegg. He's a founder of Canadians for Safe Technology, which is a volunteer-based organization which seeks to raise awareness of health issues regarding wireless technology. So Mr. Clegg, you may proceed. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, do I just ask you to uh, forward the slides for me? Sure, you can, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I, I thank the Regulatory Authority of Bermuda for the opportunity to uh, speak. I really wanna talk about the um, industry perspective. And also I have some uh, recommendations I hope you will consider. Uh, the next slide, please. I have spent my entire career in the technology sector and most recently I retired as the president of Microsoft Canada. And I've seen the tremendous benefits that technology can provide. I've also seen the potential harm if technology is not implemented correctly. And after spending several months uh, interviewing and personally meeting with experts from organizations such as Harvard, Yale, Columbia, University of Toronto, uh, advisor to the World Health Organization, a lead scientific writer for Al Gore's team that won the Nobel Prize, I've come to the conclusion that wireless technology is not safe the way we are implementing today. And I'm particularly concerned about 5G. That's why I co the C4ST. And I've also joined the advisor, uh, business advisory group for the Environmental Health Trust. Uh, next slide, please. I don't expect you to take my word for this though. There have been uh, scientists and medical professionals from around the world. You can see two highlights here. The uh, 250 scientists uh, from 44 nations who have in total published over 2000 papers about the harm uh, to humans and the environment from wireless radiation have put their reputations online, signing an appeal to the UN and its member states. In addition, 400 scientists from over 40 nations have uh, 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 signed a formal appeal calling for a moratorium on 5G in the European Union. You will hear more experts, Dr. Davis, uh, talk about some of the concerns. I'm particularly concerned about, about cancer uh, the National Institute of Health uh, funded the U.S. National Toxicology Program, a $30 million study over many years that showed clear evidence of harm, their highest category that they have um, in rats, um, which are used as a prototype for humans, and also showed damage at the DNA level. Uh, in the appendix to uh, my presentation, I've got more detailed um, uh, concerns and scientific studies uh, to talk about uh, this, this potential harm. The point I will make that all the concerns on 2G, 3G, and 4G and LTE actually apply to 
uh, for 5G technology as well. Uh, next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about my industry. I think there is a, an unbelievably privileged position my industry holds. Unlike the automotive, pharmaceutical, or chemical industries, we don't have to prove our technology is safe. All we say is it's safe if you use it. We, we meet federal guidelines. We don't say it's safe and you have to use it correctly. We hide the warnings inside devices. Uh, we introduce new technology almost at will and others, other government agencies or other organizations are forced to, to pay for the damage or harmful effects or, or to monitor it. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of influence on the legislative process uh, to, pre that, to stop anything that stops or prevents the rollout of technology. I believe that this is going to change. I think my industry was gonna come under additional scrutiny as we consider to see more security breaches. The World Health Organization is on record to update their evaluation of RF radiation because of the NTP study and others. And I think you're starting to see a shift in corporate responsibility from the public, expecting corporations to have, be aware of their input and their impact on the environment. Um, I have seen in the, uh, in the, again, in my um, uh, uh, appendix, you'll see very specific papers questioning the uh, in industry influence on organizations such as ICNRP, the EMF project, the US FCC has been called the most captured agency in the US. Um, again, the, um, uh, the next slide, please. I'd like to congratulate Bermuda on its rollout and its moratorium on 5G and my understanding of a very extensive um, network of um, uh, fiber that I hope you can continue to invest in. I'm proposing one of the recommendations the committee consider is continuing this moratorium on 5G until three things are sorted out. Other than the, the IRX, uh, the International Agency for the Research on Cancer Analysis back in 2011, there has never been an agency, whether it's in the US, the UK, Australia or Canada that has done a full review of the scientific evidence that meets international standards. And I think Bermuda has an opportunity to lead the world in asking for that to come. Uh, this also should include protecting the wildlife and the environment. There has never been, we've heard significant amount of information and hype from my industry about the trillions of dollars of benefit from 5G. There has been no publication or no analysis that I'm aware of that looks at the other side of that equation and all the potential harm that 5G can cause. We know there will be an increased healthcare costs. We know there will be lost productivity. The security and privacy breaches, as Dr. Davis had mentioned, the whole amount of radiation levels will go up exponentially. The amount of data that is going to be transferred and shared electronically and wirelessly and from machines to machines will go up exponentially. So I would submit that our security and privacy breaches will go up significantly. And right now, the industry is not paying for those breaches. The individual company or individual person has to actually pay for those. Uh, NASA and other organizations in the US have declared a major concern about the amount of satellites that are going to be input in space, tens of thousands of them that are going to actually cause harm and, are, and impact our ability to uh, predict weather and had prevent uh, uh, predict hurricanes and prepare ourselves for the damage or to prevent the damage. I would argue that a moratorium, if these, that this work was done quickly, it could actually be completed in a year. Any of the technology that's being typed, talked about in 5G right now is actually not using 5G technology. There's, the industry still has to do a lot more to, to define the specifications. So I would submit a moratorium for another year would actually not impact industry's ability to provide solutions in a safer environment. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. Uh, we are not, uh, we support wired 5G technology. We do not support all the implementations of wireless. Unfortunately, there has been a move where we only talk about wireless 5G and we only talk about smart devices that are wireless. And I think we need to shift and I hope the committee will consider shifting the focus to a wired fiber solution first. Uh, wireless radiation um, is more harmful. So a fiber does can't, it doesn't emit radiation because it, it doesn't, it can't. Uh, any wired solution is up to hundred times faster than wireless. Uh, it's far more secure. It's more reliable because you can actually, during a hurricane, your landline continues to work, whereas your wired, your cell phone will not. It's more resilient because you lay the fiber and cable one time and leave it. Uh, far more protective of the security. There's a, a very strong paper and report written by a doctor uh, Sh Sh Schleifer out of uh, the University of Colorado, Shockley, sorry, uh, who challenges the whole business case around the um, 
uh, use of wireless technology. And finally, we know that a uh, 5G cell, cell tower will use three times more power than a 4G situation. And the IEEE has written papers that show that a wireless configuration uses up to 10 times more power and electricity than a wired solution. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think that's opportunity for, for the uh, committee to recommend that the Bermuda government educate Bermudians about the potential harm from wireless devices and use them more safe. There's been studies done in the US and in Canada that show 80% of people are not aware of warnings that are buried inside cell phones and other electronic devices. And two thirds of them admit to holding that device against their body. There's been reports in the US, Canada, and France that if you hold a cell phone to your head, you actually break the safety guidelines that the manufacturers test the, their products for. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we talked, Dr. Davis talked briefly about protecting our children. Uh, there's significant recommendations on how to uh, wire school systems, uh, allowing the teacher control of the router and, and, and in a way protecting the teacher and the students. So you download the information, go to offline mode and have the students run the test or run the, run the, the uh, um, uh, tutorial and then they can get back online and upload, upload the information. Unfortunately, we're going Wi-Fi in all the schools. We're, sub we're subjecting our children and our teachers to Wi-Fi radiation, unnecessary Wi-Fi radiation as um, uh, uh, for the whole time that they're in the school environment. I think there's a chance to, um, to protect our children. Any new school should have actually it be completely wired. It's very inexpensive to wire it in a new school or any school that's going under a major uh, renovation. Um, next slide, please. Um, there are a lot of, there are some implementations that need a wired, the wireless solution, but I would submit that the majority of solutions that are available and will be available can use a current 4G network. Uh, we have two anecdotally, we, did, we were in a school here in Canada, we were able to reduce the Wi-Fi exposure to the students by 90% by a couple of minor adjustments to the routers and the power densities. One of our advisors, uh, board members has a, uh, a retail outlet, he was able to reduce the wireless radiation exposure to his, his team in his warehouse by over 100 times and less costly by just exploring different in implementations and different routers that were available. Many applications where you have to actually, you can use a store and forward. So have a, a drone, for example, or a medical situation where you can store the information and transmit at once. We've talked about smart utility meters that can have this, there's some smart utility meters that are not continuously part of a grid, but can actually uh, store that information and send it off to their, to their network once or twice a day, as opposed to uh, a thousand times every second. Um, I know I rushed through this. I want to respect my 10 minute limit. I'm 30 seconds over and I would uh, ask for any questions. As I say, there's extensive references. There's about 20 slides I have in the reference information. I do not intend to go through those, but I hope the committee will actually glance through those as you are preparing a report. So again, I thank you for the opportunity and I don't know if there's questions or if um, I, we have to go to the next speaker, but again, I thank you. Sorry, you're muted, Denton. I thought I muted. I thought I unmuted myself. Thank you. I'm not muted on here. You're good now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. And the full slide deck will be available to the public. So uh, we'll make sure that everyone can have uh, access to that. Uh, so for our next presenter, we have Mr. Victor Leach from Oceana. Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association. He has worked as a radi radiation health physicist and atmospheric scientist for the past 40 years in both private and public sectors with a number of Com Commonwealth Australian Radiation Laboratory and state government health departments. He's been a founding member of the Australian Radiation Protection Society since its inauguration in 1975. And he has published uh, in refereed scientific and engineering journals on subjects on dust and radioactivity exposure and the inhalation effects on health workers and members of the public. Uh, Mr. Leach, you may commence your presentation. Just, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay. Um, yeah, um, uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to present um, at your information session today. Um, my name is Victor Leach, as you just stated, I'm a retired radiation health physicist that worked in the field of uh, radiation protection for the last 48 years. Um, most of my colleagues in radiation health are busy uh, with jobs relating specifically to ionising radiation, that is X-rays and gamma rays, and uh, have not really taken the time to look at the potential effects of wireless radiation. The consequence of their lack of understanding is that they just accept the ICNIRP guideline as being correct. For the last five years, I've been presenting at the Australian Radiation Protection Society conferences, uh, trying to wake up my colleagues. Um, about five years ago, we formed a not-for-profit professional organisation called the Oceana Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association, quite a mouthful also, with a view to investigating the science and to fund necessary research to plug the gaps in knowledge. Also, also um, uh, receives no funds from industry, so it is no vested interest in the wireless technology. Our aim is to uh, protect people and to educate. At the start of my journey over a decade ago, I was quite sceptical that these weak wireless signals could have detrimental health implications. Together with my associates at ORSA, we decided to set up publicly, uh, publicly accessible non-biased database. If you go to slide, slide two there, which shows um, uh, that we wanted to evaluate the evidence. At the start of this data gathering process, I decided that if the studies looking at biological and health effects showed 50% effects due to wireless and 50% no effects due to wireless, then I would pursue this subject. Uh, it wouldn't go any further. To assist in this review process, we decided to start looking at existing experimental science in more detail. The available database at the time, like PubMed and the ENAP portal, were not categorised in terms of bioeffect outcomes and contained papers uh, on electrocution and medical ablation, uh, which uh, we felt were, were, were not really relevant to the subject area because they often are operated above public limits and in a controlled manner. We unanimously decided to create a specialised bioeffects database that is specifically focused on those non-thermal effects which is seen in the research. ICNERP ignore those non-thermal effects as, as they say that they don't have any real health implications. We have we have written it, uh, the most important finding in ORSA is basically summarised on this slide. As you can see, there's a lot of variability in the signals in real mobile phone signals. But what is really interesting here is that if you look at um, the research, particularly in vivo animal research, when you look at when real mobile phone signals are used, these are 3G and 4G uh, signals, you get a lot of effect studies, 120 effect studies and 18 no effect studies with this pulse uh, radiation. When, when researchers use simulated signals, that is they use microwave horns, the, the, the contrast isn't so great. So this was a, a quite a big finding to, to us and quite a shock. And uh, we also noted that other people had also noticed this overseas. But these man-made signals from mobile phones and towers are completely foreign to our bodies. They are highly variable and, and complex, complex modulated wireless signals that can penetrate deep into the body. And you can hear, you can see the sort of summary of uh, papers. For example, you'll notice uh, up, up here that um, uh, altered enzyme activity and protein, le protein, protein level changes. There's 381 papers uh, on that, uh, that show effect. You'll notice al altered gene expressions, there's 160 papers. There are lots of DNA damage. There are lots of papers on DNA damage. And in particular, um, people have referred to the US National Toxicology Program, and the, which is a near field study and the Ranzini Institute study, which animal study, shows RF to be carcinogenic. ICNERP and industry are using uh, spin to diminish these important, next slide please. If you do go to the next slide. Yeah, here are the uh, summarizing uh, some of the uh, uh, effects that we see uh, from the science. In other words, we see uh, changes in, in uh, uh, 
uh, reacting oxygen species. Uh, we see uh, uh, breaches in the blood brain barrier. There are a lot of lot of studies there. So if if you want, I've, in in my uh, I've made the text available in the in the uh, bottom of that text. You'll see um, the NPT lead designer rebuttal of ICNIRP's claims uh, that um, the these studies are faulty. They're not. They're serious studies that have been done over uh, over uh, a, a long period of time. How how anyone can dismiss these biological effects as not having health implications uh, is irresponsible and beyond me. These high frequency waves waveforms carry low frequency data that a number of studies show challenge our, ch challenge an organism's natural defences in some cases leading to dysfunction and disease. This is particularly true for children, unwell people and older citizens as wireless radiation is just another stressing agent that our bodies have to deal with. I completely disagree uh, with many government agencies that support the ICNERP approach. ICNERP claims 5G is completely safe. Government agencies compare 5G to airport scanners and police radar. Uh, to demonstrate that, that this technology is safe. This is a false comparison. Uh, one, one is intermittent exposure, while well, 5G can have the potential of 24-7 exposure. Also, the 5G signals are complex, nothing like uh, the signals that used in airport scanners and, and speed guns. The latest IPI, uh, uh, ICNERB guidelines claim to protect everyone, no matter who, who their, what their health status is which is a radical departure from their 2002 philosophy statement, where they say in that statement, in the 2002 statement, they say different groups of population may have different differences in their ability to tolerate a particular NR and non-ionizing radiation exposure. For example, children, elderly, chronically ill. Yeah, so they've deleted that statement altogether and uh, said uh, this uh, technology protect this, these, these guidelines protect everyone. ICNERP believe that, that, that all non-thermal effects have no health implications. If you go to slide six, the next one, it, this, is, this is a summary from our database of the animal experiments, all the, all the different animal experiments in the, in the non-thermal level, that is in the SARS area less than two watts per kilogram. 69% six, of all the experiments show detriment. Um, show, show effect. Um, ICNERP is a self-appointed non-government agency who act like a cartel because their membership process is a closed club, club of thermal scientists. Members of the club set up a WHO EMF project group in order to help legitimise their heating effect only viewpoint. Unlike the WHO International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, both ICNERP and WHO EMF project group have very little input from biological or medical agencies or science. ICNERP state, uh, yeah, ICNERP state there's, that they don't need a precautionary principle anymore uh, is, is not required because uh, precautions built into the guidelines. I completely disagree. They have not used any risk management methods for setting their guidelines. This is um, the International Telecommunications Agency two years ago um, gave a talk, um, it, 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 it gave a talk about uh, the problem with the ICNERP guidelines now with 5G being rolled out in places like China, Indo India, Poland, Russia, because they have a limit which is 100 times lower. This slide sort of illustrates it. This, this is uh, an Ericsson slide, by the way, um, presentation. That, what are we going to do? This, um, we've got a problem. We're butting up against the limit here. So their solution, ICNERP's solution, was to relax, relax the limit. The new guidelines are uh, 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 that make uh, the permitted levels higher. ICNERP guidelines are designed to protect humans only from shock and burns associated with acute thermal exposure. This is absolute, uh, there is absolutely no consideration given to the greater environment and its inhabitants. This uh, we talked about insects and animals are affected by this uh, radiation as well. Now we have smart fridges, coffee grinders, toothbrushes. We've got um, smart baby, ba baby, baby diapers. Um, uh, the, what's the long-term plan? 5G to enable my fridge to talk to my toaster. 
uh, changing electric, charging electric cars wirelessly a priority over human health? Where is the consumer advice? We, we, we should have strong consumer advice about using these de de devices. These devices were never intended to be used by children. We should have strong, strong consumer advice. When are health protection agencies going to look at the biocompatibility of these signals and act responsibly by limiting exposure and using optimization and precautionary philosophies that we use in the ionizing radiation space? There's also another way of doing business. I don't know if you people know about LIFI, that is light fidelity, but the digital lighting systems can also carry these, um, these internet, internet signals. There's quite a lot of uh, companies now gearing up to look at this. So there are other ways of doing business. And you heard people talk about wireless, wired technology and fiber optics. You know, I'm a strong ad advocate of not rolling out more and more of this Wi-Fi particularly when we know uh, we have a problem. Yeah, thank you. Oh, don't worry about the last slide. That, um, I, that's, uh, that's about the funding sources. Uh, uh, most of the, most of the um, uh, quite a few people have commented on the fact that um, uh, when uh, industry funds the, uh, funds the research, you have no effect studies and when the, uh, when the, when the research is funded by institutions, you, you have uh, lots of effect studies. So there's, that, that, that's a, a bit of a problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leach. Uh, we appreciate that presentation. Uh, okay, so in, in wrapping up this online information gathering session, I'd like to thank our independent advisory panel. And I uh, unfortunately didn't give them actually a chance to say hello. So I would ask for them to just kindly uh, give some greetings or salutations as I quickly uh, cycle through them. So, uh, Mr. Blakeney, you're and and you're also on mute, so you would have to unmute yourselves. All right, you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is indeed uh, a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I must admit that the presentations have been profoundly inf informative, and um, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, thank all who made the presentations for, su for such substantive uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blakeney. Uh, Dr. Croft? Hello, and uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for those presentations. As uh, I agree, absolutely, very informative. And uh, I look forward to discussing the content with my colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hurd. It's good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this uh, very important process, and, and uh, I think the uh, presentations uh, were, were well prepared and, and well thought through, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, discussing that content with, uh, with my colleagues on the, on the panel. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Dr. Mansour? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. I'm really honored to be a member of this panel and I look forward for the discussions with uh, my colleagues uh, on this very important subject over the next two months or so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mansour. Dr. Walden. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, also echoing everyone else's sentiments and I'm very honored to be on this panel and uh, again, to re-emphasize that we are grateful for the time and effort that you have put into those presentations. I think that uh, we're going to have a very fruitful time uh, as a panel to discuss all that you've presented. And I'm looking forward to doing what's best for Bermuda. And I think that's, that's our main goal. Thank you, Dr. Bowden, and thank you all the panelists. Uh, so I would also like to remind everyone and those that may not be aware, 
that a recording of these proceedings will be made available on our website. So if anyone was unable to attend, they can go to our website and add a copy of it to, to view it. And also I'd like to remind our viewing audience, you can still submit written feedback to our consultation by Monday, December 7th at 11.59 uh, p.m. when our consultation closes. So this isn't the end of the consultation, uh, it still continues. And uh, you can go to our website at www.ra.bm to, to get further information and to submit your consultation. And you can select the public consultation and send in a response if you haven't already. So our next steps, uh, once the consultation date has uh, closed, the advisory panel will convene and they will review the existing information and your submissions. And from there, the RA will pr prepare a preliminary report that will be made public for the uh, public to make comment on and to review uh, before a final decision is made by the Board of Commissioners. So once again, I'd like to thank everyone for making time. I would like to thank the panelists for joining to assist the RA in navigating these challenging issues. And we thank everyone for their contributions and we look forward to future engagements with the public. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everybody. I think we're going to end the proceedings now. Thank you everybody.